Good morning, Christchurch. Morning. Let's try one, one more time. Good morning, Christchurch. As you can tell, things look a little bit different here today. Um, we are so excited about Vacation Bible School happening tomorrow and the rest of this week. We have over um, three, close to 300 adults, yeah. youth, kids that will be here serving and learning about God this week. That is amazing. Thank you, church. Um, our theme for this week, you can read on the back of the shirts as you see these around today. It says, God, it's Breaker Rock Beach, God's rock solid truth in a world of shifting sands. And I don't know about you, but I think that that is some truth that our world needs to hear um, right now in these days. And I think that this is a beautiful time for our church to um, gather around these kids, these families that we're gonna be encountering this week and um, really show them what it means to be the church, amen? A church that's founded um, in our mission, which is to be a people on mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ. I challenge all of you as we gather for worship this morning and we prepare for that week ahead, um, how can we be unified in our mission? One church serving one amazing and wonderful and true God, amen? So as excited as we are about this week, we are also excited to meet the Lord right here in this place. Yeah. We come with anticipation and excitement. And as we join together in our opening scripture, would you stand with me as we read these words from Paul found in Ephesians 4. Say this with me. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Will you say hallelujah? We were talking this morning in, the, uh, in our rehearsal uh, just about how great it is for there to be a designated time every week for us to worship together as a body, as a family. I know everybody in this room has been worshiping all week long anyway, but it's also awesome that we get to worship together as a family. So Lord, thank you for this day. Father, we pray that our worship touches your ears, touches your heart, it reaches heaven. We thank you for who you are. Have your way in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Sing with us. Open the eyes of my heart. I 
is our opportunity to link up with heaven and sing. Holy, holy, holy. Sing. talks about uh, angels in heaven constantly telling God that he's holy. It just says that they're circling, telling him that he's holy. So I'd love for us to tell him, just like the angels are doing. So with your own song, with your own words, with your own voice, just declare the holiness of God in this atmosphere, in this, in this room, so that it fills up the room. Lord, you're holy. God, you're holy.
Lord, you're holy. You're so holy, Father. Help us to see that in every part of life. Lord, you're holy. us not to miss that, Father. Help us to see your holiness in the day by day. Help us to experience your holiness in the day by day, in our talks, in our relationships, in our health, in this country, on your earth. Help us to see you, Father. We declare that you are a holy God. You're set apart. You're different.
verse 2. church right now that are experiencing needing healing needing healing in their bodies and I believe I believe that we have the power in us to say Lord heal and it will be done and do, do I have one or two people who believe that can I get one or two more who believe that can I get three or four more who believe that? Who believe that by the, the sound of your own voice by saying, by his stripes, we are healed. The healing will come. It may seem like, well, how did you get from, from courts to healing? Because in his presence, there is healing, there is liberty, there is fullness of joy. Come on, all the things that we need are in his presence. That is why it is better one day, one day. 
God, we ask for healing in this place. Yes, Lord. Healing in our minds, healing in our spirits, and healing in our bodies. God, I speak to the spirit of infirmity right now. And I call every cell into alignment. In the name of Jesus, I call every organ whole. In the name of Jesus, we speak against sickness right now, God. You said that by your stripes, we are healed. And I believe that your blood still works. Your blood still delivers, it heals, it sets free. God, we thank you in advance that whether by miraculous, spontaneous healing or by using medical doctors and science, that you give them the wisdom and the knowledge and the medicine to be able to heal the bodies. Whether, whatever way it is, God, we thank you in advance because the healing is already done. We speak against cancer right now in the name of Jesus. We speak against mental sickness in the name of Jesus, kidney disease, heart disease, diabetes, whatever it is, God, Whatever it is not like you, God, we say call our bodies into alignment right now. We believe, God, we believe the good report. And we bless you. And we give you glory and honor and thanks and we praise you like it's already happened because we know that victory exists in Jesus. You already said we have victory, Lord, and we thank you, God, that we are victorious because of who you are, God. Thank you. This may be a little unorthodox. We normally pass the peace here, but if you feel it in your heart to link up with someone in this room and just pray with them, ask them what they need prayer for. How can I pray for you? And if they have nothing that they need prayer for, you can simply say, I love you and I pass the peace of Christ to you. Amen. Can we stretch across the aisles and do that? Christ Church Online family. It is so good to see you today. We are thankful that you've chosen to tune in and be with us in service. May I let you know that we are gonna be having our Vacation Bible School this coming week, Monday through Friday. And if you've not registered, you're welcome to come first thing in the morning, 845, we'll do registration. And our classes run from 9 to 12 noon each day. We're studying about how God is our solid rock. God never changes. He is always there. So bring your elementary age children to Vacation Bible School 
We would love to see you this coming week. Also, as we continue to study with Pastor Ben on the Holy Spirit series, may it touch your life. And also, may I give you my, my favorite proverb from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to encourage you this week. And now it leaves my brain. Isn't that like me to have a moment like this? Trust in the Lord. Here we go. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. May God bless you this week. Goodbye. the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say glory. Let's wake up a little bit this morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. This is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. You can find your way back to your seats as we transition now. And I'm going to go ahead and invite our, our kids to be able to head their way to go have fun. If you are, if you have an elementary or nursery preschool age kid, and this may be your first time, we want to invite you to head out the back of our sanctuary and head upstairs. Uh, we've got a special opportunity for them to hear the gospel and have a great time upstairs with our kids, with our kids director, Christy and their team. So we want to invite you to take part in that uh, this morning. Uh, and we're going to have a special opportunity. I don't know if anybody realized that there's something slightly different about the building today. I don't know if you picked up on that yet. But we got something called VBS happening this week. And you're going to hear about it time and time again because we're excited about it. And at the end of the service, we're going to pray and have an opportunity to pray over the week. So we will have special time for that. Uh, but... We're super excited about it. My name's Andrew Grissom. I'm the Connecting Community Pastor here at Christ Church Nashville. And all that means is I love and my team loves the opportunity to walk with you. Whether you are, have been here your whole life, whether this is your first week and you're saying, hey, I wanna go deeper. And we really believe there are three ways to be able to get plugged in, man. That team up there makes us look so good up here, man. I'm so grateful for our tech team and our AV team up there who take good care of us every single week. They're back in the back and you don't always get to see them. Uh, and if you're with us online, you don't always get to see them, but they're so faithful and we're really grateful for them. Uh, but there are really three ways that you can connect with us. If you're here with us in person, either in the lobby or in the atrium, we have a little connects area that we'd love for you to stop at and talk to one of our team members. You can text CONNECT 615-205-1098. Or if you're here with us in person, there's a little blue or green card in your pew, and you can fill that out and drop it off on your way out, and our team will reach out to you. If you're with us online, you can also submit a little comment in the little comment section on our, on our screen, and we'd love to be able to reach out to you. Here at Christ Church, just like VBS and so many other things we have going on, we want you to stay up to date with everything that we have. And so just like if you're at the restaurant, just like if you're, if you're jumping on to figure out what's going on in the world, you can scan this QR code right here and get our digital bulletin. Uh, and we'd love the opportunity to be able to connect with you with all that is going on at Christ Church. But it's not just that. You also have our, our verses, our prayer list, everything. Uh, it's a great one-stop shop shop for everything going on at Christ Church Nashville. Uh, and we also want to take an opportunity as we transition now to invite our ushers to come forward.
board to prepare for our time of offering uh, to let you know that as you see everything going on, as you see VBS, as you see other things, next week we've got our students headed to Pursuit Camp and we're excited about that, uh, and as well as so many other things, whether it's care, recovery, outreach, worship, whatever it looks like. Uh, we are so grateful that God allows us to worship in so many different ways and we get the opportunity just to walk in those opportunities. But be, because of that, it's a part of the reason that we can take part in it is because of your faithfulness. And we're so grateful for that. So this is worship. And there's really three main ways that you can give. You can give online, just like you scanned that QR code earlier. We invite you to scan this QR code as well. Text GIVE to 615-205-1098 or right after this prayer, you can give as well. And so we're gonna pass the bags across and we just wanna say thank you, thank you. It's because of your faithfulness we can do things like that and we wanna continue to do that and more. And so we let's pray and then we'll move forward in that regard. Father, we honor you, we honor you, we honor you. All of this is for you, it's not for, it's, it's not for us. We just wanna meet with you. We just want to give you every bit of the honor and the glory, God, because you're worthy of it. You are worthy of it. God, I just thank you for being able to take our offering, Lord, and be able to give it back to you, God. And so we pray, Lord, as, as we give, Lord, we pray that you would bless the gift and the giver. And God, I pray that it would all be given to make much of your name. We ask this in the matchless name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. stand to your feet with me. Let's sing that one more time. We're going to stand to hear the reading of the word from the gospel according to St. Matthew anyway, but no power of hell, no scheme of man. Let's sing it. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns 
or calls me home. Either way. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. Listen, no guilt in life, no fear in death. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry, from the beginning to the end. Final breath and beyond. Jesus commands my destiny. Sing it now. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power. Understand till he returns or calls me home, whichever one comes first, you're in his hand. If you have put your faith in Christ and said, my life is yours, the breath that is in my lungs comes from you, Spirit of God. The life that I have is your gift to me. Your mercies are new every morning. You are the one, no matter how much hell may seem to be coming against me right now, you have promised, you have promised that the church shall overcome even the gates of hell themselves. And by the church, it's not the building. The church isn't the program. The church isn't even this, this service for 90 minutes. The church is the people of God called by the name of Christ who have put their faith and their trust in him. That's who we are. That's who we are. The gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter, we've been talking about healing in body, healing in mind, and healing in, in soul and spirit. We're also going to talk about the role that, that Jesus has said that healing in relationships is meant to play in the life of his people, in the life of the church. The Holy Spirit comes not only to, to bring healing to us individually with our physical ailments or our spiritual needs and hurts and wounds, but he also comes to equip us, empower us, and direct us in how relationships, wounds can be healed among us. Offenses one to another, sins that we have committed against each other. Because what we're gonna hear about today and learn about today is that the church is meant to be a body of people who fight for each other, not fight against each other. There's a big difference. And we're gonna hear how the word describes that today, okay? So Matthew, Chapter 18, beginning with verse 15. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus says, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father, we are here aware of your power, your presence, your faithfulness, your goodness, your steadfast and abundant love. So we ask you now, word of God, speak, for our ears are opened by your spirit, our eyes opened by your grace, our hearts opened by your mercy. Put down roots, word of God, in our hearts that we may be able to bear fruit, Lord God, in and through our lives, fruit of the Spirit, rooted, as we learned last week, in love and growing in abundance, Lord, that, that we may be people who are known by the fruit of the Spirit in and through our lives, especially in our relationships one to another as brothers and sisters in Christ. So, Lord, we come with humility this morning. We come seeking you, Lord God, the bread of life, the water of life, 
We need you in every way. Speak now, Lord. Change us. Empower us. Heal us. From the inside out, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, thank you, brother. Thanks, Otto. Well, good morning, Christ Church. It's great to see each and every one of you. Uh, hold up your hands, uh, if you would, and just take a look at your fingers. Uh, make sure that you have the same number of fingers you had on July 3rd. Okay, everybody good? Okay, good, good. I, if you did have a fireworks accident, my apologies. I, we, we need to pray for that too. But uh, it, was, it was such a great week last week for many reasons, but I, I want to say thank you for allowing my family and I. We were uh, in the, the great American West last week. We had a fantastic few days in Yellowstone National Park and, and an extra day at Grand Teton National Park. And I, I, if Those of you who know me at all, you know that, that the outdoors is my happy place, and that's where I just I love to be as much as I possibly can. And Aaron and I both enjoy that so much, and we've tried to raise our kids to appreciate and value that too. And so we had a fantastic time. Uh, if you see Dylan or Luke or Zeke, ask them what they enjoyed the most, and hopefully they'll be, uh, be honest, and it'll be, it'll be good. But we had a great time. So we, we miss you, though, tremendously, of course, being gone. And uh, we're so thankful for uh, my dear brother and dear friend and, and a friend and, and beloved pastor to so many of us. Uh, pastor Greg Brewer was here last week, of course, and brought a great word. Yes. <clears throat> And so uh, Pastor Greg spoke, of course, on uh, the fruit giver, walking in the Spirit. And as we're walking in this series on the Holy Spirit, talking about you know, the person of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, and eventually we'll talk in great detail about the gifts of the Spirit, all of these aspects of who God is, is and how God is revealed through uh, what the Holy Spirit does. Uh, the Holy Spirit is God, and, and Jesus said, remember, uh, right before his crucifixion, he told his disciples, it's better for you that I go away, that I return to the Father, because when I do, I will send, and he and I will send the one who will not only be with you, but the one who will live in you. God not only with us, but God alive in us. Hallelujah. And so what a difference that's meant to make in the hearts and minds and lives, and as we will hear today, in the relationships of God's people. Because as Pastor Greg introduced last week, it all begins when we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We're meant to be a people who are known by the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And it all begins with the love of God that the Holy Spirit not only pours out within us that we can receive, but it's the Holy Spirit that, that allows the love of God to not only come to us and be received by us, but to be shared through us with one another, of course, in the family of faith that is the church, but also beyond that to those around us, whether they know God or not, whether they uh, trust God yet in faith or not, whether they are in flat out angry rebellion against God or not, the love that we have received is the love we are meant to share and show all those with whom we are sharing life and those around us, amen? And Pastor Greg did a great job of explaining that last week and what that means to speak the truth in love, what that means to walk in love. But today, we're going to take and pick up where Pastor Greg left off and continue talking about what does that actually look like in everyday application in the life of the church. Because if we're not careful, everybody can, can love to talk about love. Everybody can love to talk about, well, of course we're supposed to love each other. Of course we're supposed to be people who are known by our love. God is defined by, by the attribute of love, and so shouldn't we as people of God be defined by the same? Yes, but, but what does that look like in real relationships, especially when those relationships go sideways? Especially when there's conflict especially when there's offense, especially when there is, as Jesus says in Matthew 18, when there is sin present. So today, that's what we're going to unpack. Today, we're going to define what that means because learning to love one another in the spirit as Christ loves us means, like I said, learning how to fight for each other and not against each other. This is so important 
today. Uh, starting in the church and then, and then how much more so out beyond that into our society and, and, and beyond. We'll talk about that as we go. But, but here's the thing. Again, Matthew 18 teaches us that Jesus has given us very practical instructions, very clear commands. The question is, will we practice what Jesus preaches? That's always the question for Christians, right? We can say we love Jesus and yet not do a single thing he tells us to do. We can say how much we love him, and yet we don't trust him enough that his direction, that his guidance, that when he says walk in this way and trust the consequences to me, will we? The Holy Spirit is sent to indwell us that we might have the power, the grace, the ability to do exactly that. That's how good God is. That's how gracious, how merciful, how loving, how provision how, how, how God is, it, it's amazing. I, I just, it, the, the words fail me when I try to explain to anyone, much less myself. God never calls us to do or be anything that he hasn't promised he'll provide everything we need to do and be. Amen. What do we stand to gain if we take Jesus at his word here? What do we stand to forfeit if we do not? That's what we're gonna talk about today. So you ready? Amen. All right, Matthew 18. If you got your Bible, turn there. Uh, if not, we'll have some of these on the, on the screen. Uh, but let's make sure that we're following along with what we're doing, making sure that we understand what Jesus is teaching here. Now, context is crucial. You've heard me say that before many times when it comes to how we study the scripture. So we're not gonna start with verse 15 like we just read here a few minutes ago. We're gonna start at the beginning of, of chapter 18. And we're gonna walk through this together because whether Jesus actually taught it in exactly this order or whether Matthew, the author of Matthew, compiling this decided this makes a lot of sense to help organize Jesus' teaching in this way. Either way, I do believe the Holy Spirit intends for us to hear what's being said through Jesus in these verses preceding verse 15. Because what is Jesus doing? Starting in verse one of chapter 18, Jesus is going to define what, what kingdom life in the covenant community actually looks like. What do I mean by kingdom life? Well, this is a kind of life that's defined by the kingdom of God, not the kingdoms of men. And we're gonna see what that means here when we're talking about children and we're talking about uh, the, the, who's the greatest, these different ways that Jesus addresses these very human questions and answers them differently than, than the systems or kingdoms of this world do. What does it mean to be a kingdom community? It's that, defined by the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be a, a, a covenant community? Covenant is not a word we use very often in our language today, but covenant is very much a relationship. It is a mutual personal commitment that has been made by two parties, at least two parties, and it defines the nature of that relationship. What are the consequences if we keep this commitment to each other? What are the consequences if we don't? Biblically, that's how we should understand what marriage is, as a covenant between one man, one woman, and God. And when we define it as any other thing, some sort of legal contract, or we start to define it as, no, 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 this is about what I receive, and as long as it's working on my end, and that, that's, I, I'm, I'm out, that becomes something very different other than the biblical idea of what covenant really means. So Jesus here, I want you to understand that. He's talking about what does it mean to be a kingdom people in a covenant community. That's what the church is meant to be. To belong to the church means that you are a part of a people of covenant. We covenant to one another. That's what church, as we used to call it, membership used to be about. It wasn't just about where do you give your money and where do you serve one Sunday a month. This is about how do we belong to each other as we all belong to God. That's what Jesus is talking about. And if the church doesn't figure out how to bring that back into the forefront of who we are, that's when we see things like persecution come along to force the church to remember what's most important to remember who we are. So when it comes to understanding what Jesus is saying right from the start, let's see how he defines this. Chapter 18, verse one. So at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Sounds like a bunch of young men, right? They're posturing, they're 
putting their chests out. Who, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? That's exactly what's happening here, is they're wanting to know. Other versions, uh, Mark's gospel says they were arguing among themselves and Jesus overheard them at least uh, one other time. They're, they're doing what 20-year-old men do, trying to f- size themselves up against each other. Who's the greatest? Who, what do I have to do to be the greatest? That's what they're trying to do. It's the same today as it was then. And Jesus says to them, well, first he acts, asks, uh, acts, right? In verse two, he says, he called a child whom he put among them and said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is Matthew's version of the kingdom of God. The two are simultaneously and, and interchangeably the same term. Jesus goes on, he says, verse four, whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So let's pause there for just a minute and un- unpack this a little bit, okay? Jesus says, when they say who's the greatest, they take a, he, he brings a little, a little kid. The Greek is clear here. This is an actual child and places that child in the midst of them. And he says, unless you change, and be, become like this child. And then he expands that in the next verse a little bit. He says, unless you become humble like this child, you, you cannot enter, you cannot experience, you cannot know the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Do you, ever, do you know what he means by that? Is Zeke in here or is he upstairs? He's upstairs, Okay. I didn't want to prep him beforehand because I didn't want him to have any idea I was going to do this. But, but if, if I've done this before where I've asked children certain questions about what they know about being loved, how they know that they are loved. A child understands, seven, eight-year-old child, that child understands his or her need, his or her dependence upon a parent, hopefully, that is his or her provider and protector. They do know that their life depends upon that mother or that father who is caring for them, who is providing for them, who is protecting them, who is giving them security, yes, but even more importantly, a child understands his or her identity is received from those in authority over them who love them. It's not something they have to achieve. I pray to God that my three children know that they are my children, that my daughter and my two sons, they know they are mine simply because God chose to give them to their mother and I. They haven't had to earn their identity as my daughter or my sons. They haven't had to earn my love. They haven't had to earn my protection or my affection. They haven't had to earn the delight that I I feel every time I just think of them, much less see them when they walk in the room. They haven't had to earn any of that. That is my privilege to be able to love them and, and, and give and provide life to them every day of their lives. In a healthy parent child relationship, that That is known. And that child can just delight in life, even when things get hard, even when things get scary, even when things don't go according to the plan, that child still knows who or she, he or she is based on the goodness and the faithfulness and the identity of his father, her father, and mother, we would say. But do you see the connection to our heavenly father? So even if your earthly father or mother failed in every way, even if you never had one, or either. Every single one of us is called to know our Heavenly Father in that way and can know our Heavenly Father in that way. That's what Jesus is saying. So unless you change and become like this child in how you relate to God, in how you make yourself lowly in relationships to one another because you haven't anything to prove, God already loves you, God already knows you, God has already called you by name, you are already his. If you will walk in the truth of your identity, what do you have to prove, 20-year-old, against that guy over there? That's what Jesus is saying. Unless you change and make yourself lowly, humble yourself like a child, your identity is, is, is given to you. You don't have to achieve this. You don't have to earn this. Your identity is received from your father. The, the craziness about that is, is that in first century Jewish tradition and in Greco-Roman tradition, it was the father who gave you your name. 
the earthly father. He gave you your standing socially, culturally, financially. That's why being a widow was so devastating because your children had no longer had any identity because if there wasn't a father in the picture, they were not seen as legitimate in any way. There are no orphans with God. He is the one who says, unless you change, become like a child, recognize who you are in relationship to me. You cannot even begin to understand the kingdom. Oh, that we would change and become like children. I read, I read earlier this week uh, that the average three-year-old, this was Psychology Today reported this, and, and it's fascinating. The average three-year-old at the time of this study laughed 40 times a day. The average 40-year-old laughed three times a day. Just think about that. Oh, that we would become like children. Jesus doesn't want us to become childish. That's something else. He wants us to become childlike in how we trust our Father, how we turn to him and trust in him and recognize we don't have anything to prove to one another because of how we are loved, recognized by him. Jesus goes on, he says, verse five, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Tomorrow morning, I can't wait. 8 a.m., we're gonna be here, and one of my, my job is I get to stand out there, I get to greet every single child, every single family that comes. I love that so much, because some of those kids, they get here in the morning, and they're uh, day one, they're just like, I don't know about this, and they're kind of like this, and they're walking like, and they, they're, they're so nervous, and they're so apprehensive, you know, and, and I've seen it year after year after year after year, and then what happens is we, we try to meet them right where they are and we try to make sure that they know that God loves them, we love them, this is a great place to be, you are, you are so loved and we are so thankful you're here and this is going to be just great, this is such a great place to be with other people who are excited to be here because of who God is and who we are to each other. And so I can't tell you how many times I've seen it. Day one, they're kind of like this. But then day two, they're just right up the, right up the front. Just can't wait to bust through the door. They barely will even give me a fist bump because they got stuff to do, man. They're, they're here for their new friends. They're here for the people that are pouring into them. They're here for all of our leaders that, that, that give this whole week to just encourage and love and teach. And, oh, it's amazing. So we're going to pray at the end of the service for what is going to happen in this building and on this campus in this next week, what's already happening. Barefoot Republic has been doing day camps for the last three weeks uh, up in our space up top. It's been amazing. Uh, my daughter Dylan's been a counselor as part of that. Some of you have been helping out with that. It's been amazing. And so what God is doing, whoever welcomes, why do we do this? Whoever welcomes one such child in my name, Jesus says, welcomes me. Do you see the face of our creator in that Little one who comes. Do you see the image of God in that child? Do you see the image of God in each other, church? Do you see what Jesus is doing? He is trying to teach his disciples, you are to live a different way because you relate to each other in a different way than the broken kingdoms of this world teach you to relate to each other. This is the truth of the word. I'm not gonna stand up here and, and give you my commentary on the presidential debate. You don't wanna hear it anyway. I'm gonna teach what the word has to say. Because when we get so far off the rails, as we are in so many ways, how could we not without Jesus' teaching of the kingdom? and the power of the Spirit to walk in the way of the kingdom. This is why he continues. Jesus takes this so seriously. Whoever welcomes one child in my name welcomes me. Remember, context matters. So going on, verse six, Jesus says, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, now little ones here, it's children, yes. Young ones, yes. But it's also those now who are young in the faith. This isn't just children. This isn't just about chronological age. This also has to do with what does it mean to be somebody who is new and following Jesus. And at this time, there were plenty of people who were new and following Jesus. First century, right? So Jesus is expanding this group of the little ones, so to speak. He says, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. I mean, is that, is that serious? Is that severe? Does the heart of God care deeply for those who are tender in the faith? 
Absolutely. Verse 7, woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come. Jesus said, hey, the world's going to be the world. Brokenness, fallenness, it's everywhere. This is going to happen. But woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. Jesus says, don't let it be you. Don't let you be the reason somebody falters because they don't see the love of God in you and through you. That you profess to be a follower of Jesus and yet the fruit is not there in your life. Verses 8 and 9. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye, better than to have two eyes and be thrown into the hell of fire. Now, if you're like me, most of your life, you've probably heard this preached and taught in such a way that, that it's been interpreted individualistically. That the body being spoken of here is your body. And so whatever you gotta do, I mean, I remember being 20 years old and hearing a message on, on, on overcoming pornography and, and, and somebody's like, if you gotta pluck your eye out, whatever you gotta do, you gotta install all this software on the computer, that, that that's how you fix this, right? That was the message, I mean, I still remember that like it was yesterday. And there's application individualistically here. That interpretation has merit in certain ways at certain times. But again, context is crucial. So Jesus is talking about the body, but what body? Not your individualistic, individual body. He's talking about the body. The body that is the covenant community. The body that is his body, the church. So when he's talking about woe to the one by whom stumbling blocks come, he's talking about what is happening in the life of the church. If, if, if I am the, the hand and you are the foot, if, if, if Aaron is the ear and, 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 and Lee is the eye, whatever it might be, when it comes to how we are functioning together, if one part of the body is diseased, if one part of the body is working in a way to bring stumbling to the rest of the body, Jesus says it's better for that one part of the body to be removed. Amen. That's a hard word today. That's a hard word today. Because people hear teaching like that and they're like, well, that's not my Jesus. That's not my Jesus. My Jesus just says, come one, come all, just come here. Whose body is it? It's not my body. It's not your body. It's his body. And he is the one who gets to determine how this body functions, how this body thrives. And so there's always meant to be effort. And we're going to see it here. Jesus doesn't just say, just kick them out and be done, forget about it. He says, no, I want you to fight for each other. I want you to fight for one another instead of against each other, even if there is a brother or sister in sin. This is the mercy of God. This is the goodness of God. But it's not all just mile-high theology either. It's as practical as can be. The question is, will we practice what he preaches? Will we do what he says and trust the results to him? That's the question for the church today. This isn't a matter of a pastor just decides who belongs or who doesn't, and I just get to say because I've got all the power and authority. That, that's not it at all. That's not how church is supposed to be or how church is supposed to function. It's supposed to be a body of people who love each other so much because of the love that God has poured into us. We can't help but share that with each other, and it overflows to everybody around us. Doesn't mean everybody wants to receive that. Doesn't mean everybody wants to be a part of that covenant community, and that's okay but we do what we know God has called us to do in the power of the Spirit. So Jesus tells a parable here. And again, I think it's usually interpreted in ways other than what I think Jesus actually means here. The parable of the lost sheep. He's talking about what do you do when you have sin present? What do you do when there's this break in, uh, breaking in, in, in covenant in the community? How do we do this? How do we function in this? So he says, take care, verse 10. Take care that you do not despise one of these little ones. Despise there means literally to, to, to look down upon, to think little of, to disregard. Again, he's, he's wanting to protect those who are young in the faith. He's wanting to protect those that are tender, that are, that are still trying to figure out, can I trust God or not? Am I, am I really a part of this? Who am I in Christ? He, he's wanting to be especially protective of those little ones. And church, we must be too. 
He says, for I tell you, in the heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. When you hear that parable, who are you in the parable? Who, who are you? You're the one, right? We, we, we sing songs, we, we, we constantly, and, and I'm not saying that that's wrong, but so much of the time, we instantly go there. I was the one that Jesus left the 99, he came, he picked me up, pulled me out of the miry pit, and amen, that, that's, that's my testimony. I mean, it really is, and it's many of yours as well. But here, what is Jesus saying? He's saying there's one that's, that's, that's wandered away, there's one that's gone astray, there's one that's like a sheep that is lost, We're like the 99. And do we as the 99 care about that one the same way that the good shepherd does? Will we search, go after the one who has gone astray, the one who isn't there, the one who is missing? Well, what does that mean, Ben? It means the person that was sitting next to you in the pew the last two weeks, have you, have you thought about them when they're not here today? If you know their name, have you, have you reached out to them? if you have any way to contact them. That's something else. I, I, one time I had somebody, this is five years ago. Today, by the way, is, is, is five years to the day since I started in this position with Christ Church Nashville. It was July 7th. I think, I think COVID adds like seven dog years or something to it. I don't, I don't know, but... But my first, my first year, my first year here, I had, I had somebody come up to me and said, you know, I've sat in the same pew for a number of years and two other people have sat in that pew too and today's the first time I've ever introduced myself to them. And, and they were trying to be just, just confessing, I, I, I don't know, you know why it's taken me so long to do that. Why, why has that been so difficult? And I, and I understand, people come into a big room and sometimes you're coming from a situation or circumstances where you just, I just want to sit and be alone in the presence of God for a while. And I, I, maybe you came out of some hard things in another congregation. Maybe you've had some hard things in your family or, or maybe you're just really desperate to say, God, do you, do you see me? Do you care? Am, is this for real? and you're giving it one last shot. And you're not really listening to see how you can get connected into serving yet. You're not really wanting to be part of a life group yet. You're just like, I just, I just need time with me and, and the Lord. I don't wanna tell you that's okay. I wanna tell you, I've, I've been there too. Many of us have. But somewhere along the way, and the Holy Spirit will let you know when and how. He, he's going to prompt you. He's going to direct you. You got to get into relationship. You have to have somebody else who knows your name and knows your number. And same thing for them. You have to have that. We need that community. We need each other in that way because this is what Jesus is saying. If the one has gone astray, whether it's in sin or whether it's just they are, they are hurting and lonely and don't have any idea if anybody else even cares, it's the church that's meant to go after them because God dwells within his people. And so how does that actually happen? So Jesus, I love this. This is why context and studying the Bible in context is so important because now everything we've gotten through in these 14 verses, we're gonna drive it home in verse 15. Jesus is gonna say, so here's how this happens. When someone's gone astray, when there's been problems, if there's a rift, if there's offense, if there's conflict, if there's sin, he says, here's what you do. Verse 15, if another member of the church Another brother, it says, another sister, sins against you. Go and point out the fault on Facebook. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. No, what does he say? He says, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. Now let me, right off the bat, let me, let me make a disclaimer here. So if you are in a situation, we call this today in, 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 in counseling and pastoral care, if you are in a situation where there is a power differential, 
And what I mean by that is that if you're in a situation like if, if, if you have a problem with somebody that is in authority over you and, and there's an issue there, it, 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 it doesn't always work to go directly one-on-one with that person, okay? You may need to skip ahead to step two where Jesus says take one or two people with you that are witnesses, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a moment. But this is especially important, and I want, want to make this clear, that, that when there's, there's sin or offense present, especially if there's a situation of abuse, like I would never tell a wife who's being abused by her husband, you just need to go and sit down one-on-one with him and tell him how you feel. I would never do that. So, so there, there has to be a situation where, where we understand there, there's, there's other steps that can be taken. So, so don't hear me say this. If you're in a situation where there's a power differential, this happens in churches all the time where you've got somebody, a pastor who has misbehaved, a pastor who has abused somebody, a pastor who has, who has stepped out of line and, and somebody steps forward or, or wants to step forward to, to deal with that, goes to that person. It does, it's not going to work. It, it can't work. There has to be ways in which other people can be brought into that conversation so it can be done in a healthy way with those power dynamics are leveled, right? So what Jesus is talking about here, he's talking about, about you know, a smaller group of disciples. This would be like in a small group or something where, where you've got people that are all kind of on the same level, the same page. They're in community. They know each other. There's not this, this differential that we, we would talk about in other special circumstances. So if you go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone, what's that supposed to do? It puts you on equal footing and it puts you in a situation where it's like, hopefully this person is going to hear my perspective, understand why I feel this is a wrong or an offense they have committed against me. Hopefully there's some sort of room for, for understanding, for, for mutual shared agreement. And, and what does that do? Not only allows for forgiveness, it allows for reconciliation and moving forward in a healthy relationship. What does Jesus say there? He says, if the member listens to you, you have regained that one. Remember the, the lost sheep going after to regain that one? Do you see how they're connected here? Do you see what Jesus is doing in his teaching? The parable of the lost sheep going after the one, that one to be regained, brought back into the fold. It's the same idea here. You're not only trying to make sure that you're expressing what is, what is just and what needs to happen for forgiveness and, and what's right, how this can be done. It's not just that. What's with that is you're trying to preserve and protect the unity and the integrity of the family of faith. You're trying to say, hey, we're, we're, we belong to each other. Remember that? We're, we're, we're in covenant. We're family in Christ together. That's what you're trying to do here, even as the one who was offended. This takes maturity in the spirit. This takes the grace and mercy of God, not only poured out to you, but offered through you. And hopefully that first step works, but I need you to understand, we don't do that very often. (laughs) And we're gonna talk about why here in just a moment. But gossip, which is easier to do today than ever before, talking with everybody but that one person, one of the greatest challenges, I'm just going to get real with you, one of the greatest challenges I've faced as the lead pastor of Christ Church Nashville in five years is that. It's too many people in our family talking with everybody but the one person they've got a problem with. And it is cancer. And it is poison. And it has led to so much pain and so much misunderstanding and just flat out lies that have been present at different times over the past five years. And this isn't unique to Christ Church. This is something that happens in all kinds of churches. But I need you to hear me say on July 7th, 2024, I'm going to take a different approach as your pastor from now on. Because you can't say you didn't hear what Jesus had to say about this. And I will speak to you in love and I will speak to you with grace, but I'm going to speak to you, as Greg said last week, I'm going to speak the truth to you in love. Because we can't protect each other this way. We can't look out for each other this way. We can't fight for each other if we're just talking about each other. It doesn't work like that. No matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it might be, we have to do this if we're going to be healthy, especially in an increasingly unhealthy society. So Jesus says, but maybe that doesn't work. Verse 16, so if you are not listened to, if you can't come to an agreement, you can't come to reconciliation, then he says, take one or two others along with you. Not so that, you know, he's not saying these are people that already agree with you. 
Don't get your own you know, cheering section to go beat this person up verbally or otherwise. He's saying, these are, these are witnesses. Take these people with you, people you can trust, people who are objective, people who are maybe outside this particular conflict, but hopefully know both of you to some extent at least, right? You're in covenant community together. Take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen, tell it to the church. Now the church here is not 800 people in a big sanctuary. The church here is what we would call a small group. People who know each other. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where they decided they were going to practice church discipline and, and somebody gets hauled up here. Half of y'all, most of y'all don't even know that person and you're supposed to make some sort of, 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 of call about whether or not they stay in the fellowship of the community. That's, that's ridiculous. And that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about a true covenant community of people where people know each other where they are connected. It'd be much more akin to a, a, a legitimate small group or life group today. Some sort of group that, that people are committed to each other, they know each other. That's who he's talking about. And if they won't listen to them, Jesus says, let such a one be treated as a Gentile or a tax collector. What does Jesus mean by that? He's not trying to just degrade tax collectors or Gentiles. He's saying not everybody wants to be a part of a community like this. And sometimes people do. Some people will leave. Some people will move on. Some people have other reasons that they decide to go. And he says, that, that's, that, let, let everyone who wants to be a part of this abide by what it takes to make covenant community work. Everybody else is not bound by that. But for those who do want to be a part of this, Jesus says you have to fight for each other. So that's the question. Will we do this, Christ Church? Will we fight for each other in this way? Because I tell you this right now, when people see a covenant community that does that, not to, I'm not talking about controlling each other. I'm talking about loving each other in this kind of way. I'm here to fight for you, not to fight against you. I hope you do the same for your brother or sister with you. I hope that you can know that if you're a part of Christ Church, this is a body of people that fights for each other. This is a body of people that want to do whatever it takes to make sure we are in this together, even when that gets hard. Because why, why don't we do this? And real quickly, I'm gonna wrap this up so we can, we can pray together. Why is this so important and why do we fail to do it? Number one, it can be really uncomfortable, right? At least to start. Most of us, there are some people, some people love to fight. Some people love confrontation. They, they just, they just, they live for that. They, they get a rush out of it. It's a dopamine hit for them to, to start something. But most people aren't wired that way. Most people try to avoid confrontation. Most people try to avoid conflict however they can. Maybe you've had a bad experience in the past. Maybe you tried to do it this way that Jesus outlines. Maybe you tried to talk to somebody and it ended up going south real quick. That person agreed with you in private, but then they turned around and they started doing all kinds of what they thought was damage control to, to, to make sure that they painted you out to be such an evil, horrible, terrible person. They lied about you. They slandered you. They did all that. I had that happen to me in the church 20 years ago. And if you'd have told me then when I was a musician, that one day I'd be a pastor, I'd say, ain't no way. I want nothing to do with any of that. I still had faith in God. I had zero faith in God's people, including myself. That was 20 years ago. So I understand when you try to do it the right way and, and other people don't want to play by those rules. Other people don't want to do it that way. Other people decide, okay, yeah, I, okay, okay. And then you turn and then they go. And it's way worse today. Again, with social media, with everything else. I understand that. And that's what we do. We want to be comforted. We go talk to our friends that we know are going to agree with us. We go to our echo chambers on Facebook and make sure, hey, here's a hypothetical situation. Asking for a friend. <laughs> what would you do if? Right? And that's how we handle it. And it, it, just, it just causes more division. It causes more strife. 
Now again, I, I, in situations where there's a power differential, that, that's, that's special and that's different, like I said. Then, then, yeah, get two or three people you can trust, mature brothers or sisters, people that you know can go as witnesses that can help facilitate, that can be more objective in the conversation. That's important. The second thing is that, that prevents us from doing this, number one is just it's, it's uncomfortable and it's hard sometimes, that's number one. Number two is, again, context is crucial. Our social context is way more interested in how we can be divided than how we can be united. I mean, on the 4th of July, did anybody actually believe, did anybody actually believe today that we are one nation under God, indivisible? Does anybody believe that today? I recited that every single day when I stand up in my classroom at Lake Mills Elementary School, hand over my heart, believing that, well, whatever happens, we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't know any Americans that actually think that's who we are today. Why not? Because we, the people, allow ourselves to be played. We allow ourselves to be pitted against each other by professional politicians who profit off of our division. That's just the way it is. There's so much money to be made in telling you who you need to be afraid of and who you need to be against. And when this infiltrates the church, who is meant to operate by a completely different ethic. Not just that, we're supposed to be defined by the spirit of God that is not the spirit of the world, that lives within us. It doesn't mean we stick our head in the sands. It doesn't mean we pretend that, that, that there is peace when there isn't peace. It doesn't mean we call what is unjust, just. No, we go about fighting for justice, fighting for peace, fighting and working for each other in a totally different way than the world does it. But we've sold our souls into thinking that, well, it's gotta come through Washington if we're gonna make any difference. That's not how it works. It didn't work, I mean, Jesus didn't do that with Rome. Far more powerful empire of its day than the United States is in ours. I love this country and I hope to God it can turn around. I hope to God that it gets better for my kids and my grandkids by God's mercy. I hope to God that it does, but I ain't waiting on politicians to make the difference. I'm gonna do all that I can today. If you wanna know how to make a difference, church, and this is where we have to bring it to a, to a close for today. If you wanna know how to make a difference, you start loving each other the way Jesus says we're supposed to love each other. So when you have a problem with somebody in this church, you go to that person. You talk to them directly. You say, can we go have a cup of coffee? Can we, can we go have dinner? And, and you just sit down and say, listen, I, I love you. And, and we're part of this family together. And, and here's something that's bothering me. Here's something that I'm struggling with. And I just, I, I want to know if you can help me with this. And, and you, just, you just talk. And if that doesn't work. Then, then, then you call somebody. You, you, you might call a pastor. You might call, you might call me. You might call somebody else that you know in your, in your Sunday school class or your small group. You might call somebody. And, and this is why the third thing that keeps us from living this way is that we don't have community. Yes. It can be uncomfortable. Our culture tells us we're supposed to be divided instead of united, which is wrong, but it's normal now. And the third thing is we don't invest ourselves in community, yes. which requires Stepping out and saying, I got to get connected with other people. And you can do that through a Sunday school class at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. You can do that by joining a life group, which is so important, so vital. You can do that by, by serving. You can do that by showing up tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. and saying, Ben, can I stand with you out front and greet all these awesome kids? And I'll say, come on. And I'll introduce you to as many people as I can. And, and we're going to get you serving is one of the greatest ways you start to meet people and start to form relationships that might bless you the rest of your life. But the question is, are we going to love each other this way, church? Are we going to practice what Jesus preaches? Are we going to fight for each other instead of fighting against each other? Because the world is wiser than we are when they see that and say, I, got, I ain't got time for that. I got enough chaos in my life. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask all of our... VBS volunteers and leaders, if you guys will come down, I'm gonna have you line up right here in the front. And come on down, y'all. Some of you got your t-shirts on, which is great. 
If you didn't, didn't wear yours today, that's okay too. It's all right. But as they're coming down, here's what I want you to understand, church. This isn't just about the people that can be here Monday through Friday this week. This is about all of us, okay? Because even if, if you're at work this week and you're like, oh, I wish I could be there, but I can't, or I, I totally understand that. But what you can do is pray. What you can do is absolutely be praying, praying every, every single day for the, the kids and the families that are going to be here. We can stretch down a little bit more this way, guys. You guys are good. You, we can absolutely be praying for our, our leaders who are giving of their, their time and their energy this week and pouring into these kids and making connections and loving these families. It's so important. So important. All right, so we got our leaders down here. So now here's what we're gonna do. So just to show that this is not just about these people in the white t-shirts or we'll be wearing the white t-shirts tomorrow morning. It, it is absolutely about the whole church. I want you, everybody, if you can, stand to your feet. If you're able to stand, please do. And here's what I want us to do. I know it's, we're kind of spread out, but if, if whoever you're next to, go ahead and, and link arms with them, okay? Link arms with them. And then wherever there are gaps... Like Adam over here is amazing, but he, I promise he smells good. There's nothing wrong with him. He shouldn't be there by himself. So, so wherever the gaps are, move, move so we're connected. Let's, let's make sure that, that we don't have any like islands of two or three, okay? Move and get connected. Let's, let's close the gaps. Let's connect. Let's connect. Let's connect all the way around. We can do it. We can do it. Just don't, don't hang off the balcony. Just be careful. There is a certain, certain limit, but other than that. But no, let's get connected. Yeah. So look, look around. Look around, not just at the, at the volunteers and, and folks that are serving up front here. Look around in the whole, whole sanctuary. And for those of you that are with us online that couldn't be here with us in person today, I mean, we, we are including you in this. If Christ Church is your home and you are part of this covenant family of faith, this is, this is who God has call, called you to fight for. And there are people that are not here today for whatever reason. It's the 4th of July weekend. They may be traveling. There are people that may be sick. They're all different things. I mean, I mean, who is the person right now that the Spirit is laying upon your mind and in your heart to, to fight for that you're like, you know what? I got to give her a call. You know what? I'm going to reach out to him. I'm going to make sure to connect with them, find out how they're doing, where they are. This is your family and faith that God has said, you need these people. These people need you. Fight for one another. Jesus said, the world will know you belong to me. The world will know you are my disciples if you love one another as I have loved you. The way we practically do that is by fighting for each other, by lifting each other up, encouraging each other. And even when we hurt each other, and we will, even when we offend each other, and we will, even when we sin against each other, and we will, because we're all broken humans on the path of the kingdom with healing and, and, and restoration that has yet to be fulfilled and completed in us. Even when this happens in us and we do these things to each other, we fight for each other by understanding that if I'm the one who's been sinned against, I got to go to my brother and my sister in love and, and talk about this. If I have sinned or offended uh, my brother or sister, when they come to me, I, I have to receive and I have to say, yes, please, let's, let's, let's work this out. Let's, let's work through this together. So Father, we just come to you now as people who are called by your grace and your love, called out of darkness into your wonderful and marvelous light, the light of your son, the light of your kingdom in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Lord, we come to you that you would make of us as we started this worship service from Ephesians 4, you would make of us one church, one body, one baptism, one Lord revealed in uniting all of us, Lord God. One spirit that makes of us one body. So, Father, forgive us when we have, have not followed your teaching, Lord Jesus, when we have, have, have gone to others instead of the one that we needed to address, when we have gossiped or we have slandered, when we have done things, Lord God, that have caused division rather than fought for unity, when we have done things that have caused distrust and, and brokenness and, and caused people to feel far deeper pain, maybe than the initial offense caused. When we have done that, we repent now in the name of Jesus. We, we turn, we change. We ask you, Holy Spirit, not only to empower us, but, but let us walk in boldness and obedience to follow 
to practice what you have declared is the right thing and the right way, Lord God. What we are to do and how we are to be. So Lord, we lift up all these children that will be coming this week. So many kids from our congregation, so many kids from the surrounding neighborhoods and community and the city. Lord, let us just be filled to overflowing with your love and your goodness that we can just pour this all over these kids that no child, no family will come this week and doubt for a moment the the unbelievable, radical love of God that is pursuing them, that knows them by name. When we look each child in the eye and encourage them and we point out goodness in them. We point out light in them. We, we lift them up and help them recognize the identity, Lord, that you have given them that has nothing to do with what they achieve. It has everything to do with who they are as your creations, as your tender little ones, Lord God, that you have put such, such a premium on in the kingdom of God. So Lord, let us walk in obedience, trusting you, following you, loving those that you have called and set before us. We are so thankful, Lord, so grateful. So fill us to overflow that we cannot help but love these children and these families and one another in this way. I pray, Lord, for all those who are hearing my voice right now who need healing, as we prayed earlier, in their bodies and their spirits and their souls, but also healing in relationships, Lord, healing in our families, healing within the church where there's brokenness and and suspicion or or anxiety and fear of, of, of other people's thoughts or feelings or dismissal. Lord, remove that in Jesus' name. Cast that out from us. Let the Holy Spirit reign in our hearts and our minds, our conversations, how we speak of each other, how we speak of ourselves, how we seek reconciliation, how we seek to work for each other and the good of one another, Lord. Make us a church that's a family that fights for each other, that others say, I want to be a part of that, for they love each other so well. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we love you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One more thing before we dismiss. As you are leaving this building, I, I, you, you already know this, but it, it, it bears mentioning again, there'll be kids all over this place and, and, and families all over this place all week long, right? So however you leave today, whatever door you go out, whatever exit you may use, would you pray over the space as you go? It's so important, and we, we take that so seriously. Oftentimes we think about praying over the sanctuary, which we do on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings. There's, there's, there's several people that, that pray about you know, what's gonna be happening in here when we gather for worship. But today, if you're leaving up by the nursery exit, if you're leaving down by the office entrance, if you're going out the top parking lot, if you're in the atrium on your way out, wherever you may be, just would you please do that? Just, just pray over these areas that God would be made known, that God would be revealed, that God would be glorified, and people would be so undeniably drawn to him as he has made himself available and is drawing close to us and these little ones he's bringing to himself this week. Would you do that for us, please? Thank you. I love each and every one of you and so thankful for you. Let's fight for each other and just see what kind of life, kingdom life, God just grows by the Spirit in and through his church. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor. May he give you his peace. May all that we are and all that we do be for his glory because we are people that have known and know his love. How can we not go forth to love God and love one another in thanks to him? Amen. Amen. God bless you.